a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Dixie, Song Dixie, also known as, Dixie's Land, I Wish I Was in Dixie, and other titles, is a popular song in the southern United States. It is one of the most distinctively southern musical products of the 19th century and probably the best known song to have come out of blackface minstrelsy. It was not a folk song at its creation, but it has since entered the American folk vernacular. The song likely cemented the word, Dixie, in the American vocabulary as a nickname for the southern United States. Most sources credit Ohio-born Daniel Decatur Emmett with the song's composition, although other people have claimed credit, even, during Emmett's lifetime. Compounding the problem are Emmett's own confused accounts of its writing and his tardiness in registering its copyright. The latest challenge has been made on behalf of the Snowden family band of Knox County, Ohio, who may have collaborated with Emmett to write. Dixie, Dixie, originated in the blackface minstrel shows of the 1850s and quickly became popular throughout the United States. During the American Civil War, it was adopted as a de facto national anthem of the Confederate States of America. New versions appeared at this time that more explicitly tied the song to the events of the Civil War. Since the advent of the Civil Rights Movement, many have identified the lyrics with the iconography and ideology of the Old South. Today, Dixie, is sometimes considered offensive, and its critics claim that singing it demonstrates a sympathy for slavery or racial separation in the American South. Its supporters, on the other hand, view it as a legitimate aspect of Southern culture and heritage and the fight for states' rights and freedom, from big government. The song was a favorite of President Abraham Lincoln. He had it played at some of his political rallies and, at the announcement of General Robert E. Lee's surrender. Structure Dixie, is structured into five two-measure groups of alternating verses and refrains, following an arbk pattern, as originally performed. A soloist or small group stepped forward and sang the verses, and the whole company answered at different times. The repeated line, Look away, was probably one part sung in unison like this. As the song became popular, the audience likely joined the troupe in singing the chorus. Traditionally, another eight measures of unaccompanied fiddle playing followed, coming to a partial close in the middle. Since 1936, this part has rarely been printed with the sheet music. The song was traditionally played at a tempo slower than the one usually played today. Rhythmically, the music is characterized by a heavy, nonchalant, inelegant strut, and is in duple meter, which makes it suitable for both dancing and marching. Dixie employs a single rhythmic motive, which is integrated into long, melodic phrases. The melodic content consists primarily of arpeggiations of the tonic triad, firmly establishing the major tonality. The melody of the chorus emulates natural inflections of the voice, and may account for some of the song's popularity. According to musicologist Hans Nathan, Dixie resembles other material that Dan Emmett wrote for Bryant's Minstrels, and, in writing it, the composer drew on a number of earlier works. The first part of the song is anticipated by other Remit compositions, including The Wild Goose Nation, itself a derivative of Gumbo Chaff, and ultimately an 18th century English song called Bow Wow Wow. The second part is probably related to even older material, most likely Scottish folk songs. The chorus follows portions of Johnny Roach, an Emmett piece from earlier in 1859. As with other blackface material, performances of Dixie were accompanied by dancing. The song is a walk around, which originally began with a few minstrels acting out the lyrics, only to be joined by the rest of the company. As shown by the original sheet music, the dance tune used with Dixie by Bryant's Minstrels, who introduced the song on the New York stage, was Albany Beef. An Irish style reel later included by Den Emmett in an instructional book he co-authored in 1862. Dancers probably performed between verses, and a single dancer used the fiddle solo at the end of the song to strut, twirl his cane, or moustache, and perhaps slyly wink at a girl on the front row. Lyrics Countless lyrical variants of Dixie exist. But the version attributed to Dan Emmett and its variations are the most popular. Emmett's lyrics as they were originally intended reflect the mood of the United States in the late 1850s toward growing abolitionist sentiment. The song presented the point of view 
common to minstrelsy at the time, that slavery was overall a positive institution. The pining slave had been used in minstrel tunes since the early 1850s, including Emmett's, I Ain't Got Time to Tarry, and Johnny Roach. The fact that Dixie and its precursors are dance tunes only further made light of the subject. In short, Dixie made the case more strongly than any previous minstrel tune had that slaves belonged in bondage. This was accomplished through the song's protagonist, who, in comic black dialect, implies that despite his freedom, he is homesick for the plantation of his birth. The lyrics use many common phrases found in minstrel tunes of the day, I wish I was in, dates to at least, Claire de Kitchen, and, away down south in, appears in many more songs, including Emmett's, I'm Gwine Over the Mountain. The second stanza clearly echoes, Gumbo Chaff, from the 1830s, then Mrs. She did marry Big Builder Weaver, soon she found out he was a gay deceiver. The final stanza words portions of Emmett's own, De Wild Goose Nation, De Terrapin he thought it was time for to treble, he screw her in his tail, and begin to scratch gravel. Even the phrase, Dixie's Land, had been used in Emmett's, Johnny Roach, and, I Ain't Got Time to Tarry. Both first performed earlier in 1859. As with other minstrel material, Dixie, entered common circulation among blackface performers, and many of them added their own verses or altered the song in other ways. Emmett himself adopted the tune, for a pseudo-African American spiritual in the 1870s or 1880s. The chorus changed to, I wish I was in Canaan oh Abada, oh Abada. In Canaan's land a colored man can live and die in clover oh Abada, oh Abada, oh Abada in the land of Canaan. Both Union and Confederate composers produce war versions of the song during the American Civil War. These variants standardized the spelling and made the song more militant, replacing the slave scenario with specific references to the conflict or to northern or southern pride. This Confederate verse by Albert Pike is representative, Southrons. Hear your country call you. Up. Lest worse than death befall you. Hear the northern thunders mutter. Northern flags in south wind flutter, send them back your fierce defiance. Stamp upon the cursed alliance. Compare Francis J. Crosby's Union lyrics, on. Ye patriots to the battle. Hear Fort Moultrie's cannon rattle. Then away, then away, then away to the fight. Go meet those southern traitors, with iron will. And should your courage falter, boys, remember Bunker Hill. Hurrah! Hurrah! The stars, and stripes forever. Hurrah! Hurrah! Our union shall not sever. A second, unofficial, Union version was popular among Union troops, referred to as Union Dixie, away down south in the land of traitors, rattlesnakes and alligators, right away, come away, right away, come away, where cotton's king and men are chattels, Union boys will win the battles, right away, come away, right away, come away. Then we'll all go down, to Dixie, away, away. Each Dixie boy must understand that he must mind his Uncle Sam. The new Dixie, the true Dixie for northern singers, takes a different approach, turning the original song on its head. Then I'm glad I'm not in Dixie Hooray. Hooray. In Yankee land I'll took my stand. Nor let no die in Dixie soldiers on both sides wrote endless parody versions of the song. Often these discussed the banalities of camp life, pork, and cabbage in the pot. It goes in cold and comes out hot or, vinegar put right on red beet, it makes them always fit to eat. Others were more nonsensical, way down south in the fields of cotton, vinegar shoes and paper stockings. Aside from its being rendered in standard English, the chorus was the only section not regularly altered, even for parodies. The first verse and chorus, in non-dialect form, are the best-known portions of the song today. I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixie Land. In Dixie Land where I was born in, early on a frosty morning, look away, look away, look away, Dixie Land. Then I wish I was in Dixie, hooray, hooray. In Dixie Land I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixie, away, away, away down south in Dixie, away, away, away down south in Dixie. Composition and Copyright According to tradition, Ohio-born minstrel show composer Daniel Decatur Emmett wrote, Dixie, around 1859. Over his lifetime, 
Emmett often recounted the story of its composition, and details vary with each account. For example, in various versions of the story, Emmett claimed to have written, Dixie, in a few minutes, in a single night, and over a few days. An 1872 edition of the New York Clipper provides one of the earliest accounts, claiming that on a Saturday night shortly after Emmett had been taken on a songwriter for the Bryant's Minstrels, Jerry Bryant told him they would need new walk-around by the following Monday. By this account, Emmett shut himself inside his New York flat, and wrote the song that Sunday evening. Other details emerge in later accounts. In one, Emmett claimed that, suddenly, I jumped up, and sat down at the table to work. In less than an hour I had the first verse and chorus. After that it was easy. In another version, Emmett stared out at the rainy evening and thought, I wish I was in Dixie. Then, like a flash the thought suggested the first line of the walk around, and a little later the minstrel, fiddle in hand, was working out the melody. Yet another variant, dated to 1903, further changes the details. I was standing by the window, gazing out, at the drizzly, raw day, and the old circus feeling came over me. I hummed the old refrain, I wish I was in Dixie, and the inspiration struck me. I took my pen and in ten minutes had written the first verses with music. The remaining verses were easy. In his final years, Emmett even claimed to have written the song years before he had moved to New York. A Washington Post article supports this, giving a composition date of 1843. Emmett published, Dixie, on June 21, 1863 Firth, Pond and Company in New York. The original manuscript has been lost. Extant copies were made during Emmett's retirement, starting in the 1890s. Emmett's tardiness registering the copyright for the song allowed it to proliferate among other minstrel groups and variety show performers. Rival editions and variations multiplied in songbooks, newspapers, and broadsides. The earliest of these that is known today is a copyrighted edition for piano from the John Church Company of Cincinnati, published on June 26, 1860. Other publishers attributed completely made-up composers with the song, Jerry Blossom, and Dixie Jr., among others. The most serious of these challenges during Emmett's lifetime came from Southerner William Shakespeare Hayes. This claimant attempted to prove his allegations through a Southern Historical Society, but he died before they could produce any conclusive evidence. By 1908, four years after Emmett's death, no fewer than 37 people had claimed the song as theirs. Dixie is the only song Emmett ever claimed to have written in a burst of inspiration. An analysis of Emmett's notes and writings shows a meticulous copyist who spent countless hours collecting and composing songs and sayings for the minstrel stage. Little evidence was left for the improvisational moment. The New York Clipper wrote in 1872 that Emmett's claim to authorship of Dixie was and is still disputed, both in and out of the minstrel profession. Emmett himself said, show people generally, if not always, have the chance to hear every local song as they pass through the different sections of the country, and particularly so with minstrel companies, who are always on the lookout for songs and sayings that will answer their business. He claimed at one point to have based the first part of Dixie on Come for Lander Let's Be Marching, Everyone for His True Love Searchin', which he described as a song of his childhood days. Musical analysis does show some similarities in the melodic outline, but the songs are not closely related. Emmett also credited Dixie to an old circus song. Despite the disputed authorship, Firth, Pond and Company paid Emmett $300 for all rights to Dixie on February 11, 1861, perhaps fearing complications spurred by the impending civil war. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?